Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Dili. Uh, he received his PhD in astrophysics from Cornell in 2002, and for his thesis, he worked on the Arecibo radio telescope in the Puerto Rico. At that time, the largest radio telescope in the world. Uh, not anymore. Uh, he then joined the Harvard Smithsonian Center of, for Astrophysics as an astronomer, and then he moved to Caltech as a National Research Council Fellow in 2005. And uh, since uh, 2012, uh, he was appointed the Chief Scientist and Professor of Radio Astronomy Division in the National Astronomical Observatories of China, CAS. So uh, today's topic is FAST, and uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Lee. All right, so that's the telescope uh, that I've been working on for the past five years, and that will be the uh, topic of today, since I wrote the abstract uh, based on uh, the status in the middle of uh, October, so it's the title, and the things are uh, uh, progressing really quickly. So everybody probably heard of Moore's Law, which is about the density of transistors, and actually met uh, uh, Henry Young a couple of weeks ago, who got to talk to Gordon Moore about his law. Um, in terms of modern technology, many things uh, has exponential growth. So these are two more examples. This is the storage, and this is internet speed. We also have human capacity, which also seem to be on exponential growth, albeit on a much longer time scale. It, the, double roughly every one and a half million years. There's large scatters, uh, maybe due to certain event like the uh, election of Mr. Trump. Um, so this is the telescope. This is a real picture. You can see the Star Trek. So that's uh, exposure roughly about 20 minutes. In that time, there's a truck that drive underneath the dish. And it's a radio dish. It's full of holes. As long as the host is much smaller than the wavelength, it's still a perfect reflector. So it's translucent. You can see the light. And we go called FAST, which is shorthand for 500 meter aperture spherical radio telescope. It's exactly what it is. It's quite descriptive. It's also a sort of Morse law. So this is absolute sensitivity, which has a units of uh, Square meters per Kelvin is the effective aperture divided by noise temperature, so it's the absolute sensitivity. This is some famous observatory. This is time. It's exponential growth. It's slower than Moore's law, but by September 2016, officially, we are on top of that curve, below 3 gigahertz. 500 meter, it's big, but, you know, if... It's even more impressive in volume. If we fill up the dish with fried rice, every person in the world gets two. If you have to drink, you have to share a bottle of wine with someone else. So this is uh, my uh, outline. I've talked about the engineering concept of our science efforts so far, and the current uh, large sky survey plan, so-called crafts, and our challenges uh, in the next uh, just few years. I cannot look too far. So this project uh, has been uh, driven by NLC for the past more than 20 years, but officially approved end of 2007. And uh, in 2008, I was appointed a uh, project scientist, but uh, I was still in US. Uh, and the construction started in March 2011, and it's a five and a year, five and a half, project, and we finished the project exactly on the day of the contract. So that's on the day of September 25th. That's our chief engineer, uh, Dr. Nan. That's the vice prime minister. That's president of Chinese Academy of Sciences. And we also get a letter from president of the country, which uh, gives us this nickname called Chinese uh, Sky Eye. And we are in the commissioning, so hopefully uh, normal operation will start uh, one and or one year, half from now. So back to the size, uh, which gives us the ampere of sensitivity. All the figure on this uh, slide are to scale. The largest fully mobile primary is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, US. 
Basically, you have to move this 7,000 ton, the size of Statue of Liberty, and you have to move it precisely in 3D space. So you basically have to float this telescope and move it at least on two axes so you can counter-rotate the Earth. And this is the limit, engineering limit, of such concept. But we also have this wonder of the 20th century science construction called Arcebo with 300 meter. It's in this cast formation. It discovered the first exoplanet. It first measured the spin of Mercury and has done many, many wonderful things. And to go beyond that is the fast concept. So instead of one primary, we also sit in the cast formation, but we have a larger primary made of 4,500 panels. And we move each one of them in real time, and we measure them down to the accuracy of a few millimeter. So essentially, we form a primary focused telescope with this small cabin that holds the electronics that move in coherence with the primary surface. So this is our telescope, and you can see the triangular pattern. That's the 4, 000, more than 4,000 panels. Each is about 11 meters. And I think even more impressive is the focal cabin. That is a 13-ton structure, but they are suspending air by this very thin thread. It's only about 4.6 centimeter in diameter. And that has to, six cables, has to give you enough degree of freedom, you can control it precisely uh, in 3D space. And there's a few numbers. We have the, there's a dome, the panels, the six cables. Uh, we have 10 laser total stations that actually shine the laser. And on the, both the dome and the dish, and that's the 30-ton dome looking from underneath, and it can move it precisely in, in the 3D space. So this is the concept from the get-go. And if we can see infrared, you can see the laser beam. And, but we cannot see the laser beam, so the next picture is what I took in the summer of 2015. So at the time, on site, there's exactly zero artificial light. So everything you see here is reflected light when I just click on the flash. So if you are at one of these measuring towers, you add the focus of those reflectors. And at that instance that you click on the flash, you'll see all this reflected light. And by measuring the location and triangulate the lights, we can precisely control our telescope, both the dome and the primary surface. Uh, that's all sounds uh, easy, but uh, it, it took, took us uh, uh, decades to, to come up with the uh, concept and actually build it. So that's the site. That's a picture taken in 2007. There's a family. Uh, oh, uh, it's a, uh, with the last name Young. They have lived there for more than 19 years, but they are happy to move out because they are, for their kids to go to school, they have to climb up this hole uh, and walk another seven kilometers to a nearby school. <clears throat> so that's 2011. We, 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 uh, we have to uh, destroy some of its beauty. That's 2012. We do site uh, construction. That's 2013. We start to put in stews. That's the beginning of 2015. Now we have the girder ring, have the cable mesh system. The next thing we do is to put in the panels. Uh, we do it slightly slower than that. So there's a crane that will take up this two 11 meter things. So it's like two little houses and send it down by cables. There's a worker sitting on the drawing to knot to try to screw it in place. Uh, this is done in a little less than a year. And for many times, there are workers dangling above the ground like 20, 30 meters. They are supposed to put on safety belt, but they not always do that. And fortunately enough, we, 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 we don't have any uh, deaths or uh, serious accidents in, in, in the whole uh, process, which is luck. So that's the concept. And in operation, so this is the default position. So default position is a 300 meter radii sphere. And by dragging the panel up and down, uh, in the total range of about, only about a meter, that gives you enough 
displacement to change it from a sphere to a 300 meter radii parabola that you can focus parallel light. And, uh, and this is real measurement in terms of the error from its expected a position in millimeters. So we get on to about five millimeter RMS in primary uh, in the middle of this year. And so now the telescope starts to work uh, by June of 2017. And by July, we also realized tracking. So by August, we start taking real data. Uh, so in this whole process, there are many, many uh, patents. Uh, we work with more than 70 companies. And some of this patent already start to work in other real large uh, projects. For example, in order to move this 30 ton cabin by that six thin cables, you really have to have very fatigue resistant cables and that can stretch hundreds of thousands of times. So that's a new management system, there's new material and, uh, and that is right now putting into use by the same contractor in to build this large uh, bridge, connect Hong Kong and Macau. So in three years, uh, it, it, it will be uh, uh, also finished. So it's, uh, it's already a, uh, a quite uh, amazing engineering achievement. But now uh, we want to uh, move on. We want to uh, commission it and to be a science instrument. So that will be the second part of my talk of what we uh, want to do in terms of science. So it's a radio instrument. It uh, continuously covers between 70 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. So that including like a radar band, cell phone, Bluetooth, wireless, all the euro suspects. So also making this band extremely hard to work with in the modern era <laughs> because it's full of uh, uh, man-made signals. But we are looking toward the universe. So the, the most obvious target is so-called 21 centimeter line. It's a hyperfine uh, um, uh, transition. So when the uh, electron spin interact with the nucleus, it, it can flip. It uh, give you a photon roughly the size of a basketball, uh, if, if you have the classical picture. But it's the majority of the baryon uh, in the universe. Uh, and also pulsars, uh, this heavy uh, or very dense neutron star is also a precise uh, cosmic clock that you can use to test gravity, measure gravitational wave, and all the planets and the, uh, the, the stars and probably life is all formed in monocular clouds. So we also do uh, spectroscopy of the interstellar medium and we also search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's part of the formal science plan. Um, but to us, it's more like a signal processing engineering challenge. So in order to study the potential and to organize to all this, in the last five years, I, I have been leading this science preparation effort funded by MOST at the level of about $1 million a year. We published 273 uh, international peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, 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 graduated 51 PhDs, eight postdoctoral fellows, has some, a few uh, important, uh, hopefully, uh, important uh, publications, uh, including things like we found two new types of mega maser, increasing the total number from three to five, to discover two new uh, millisecond pulsars. So that's uh, directly in uh, the fast uh, relevant science area. Now we have confidence that we know how to search for masers, we know how to search for uh, pulsars. So in this, uh, particularly this uh, three area, so the H1 pulsar and molecular spectroscopy. Here is the sort of rough outline of the science. It's very rough. So the so this is the redshift uh, looking back in time, and this is the specific star formation rate. So uh, we have an evolution of the universe. So most of the stars uh, are formed at the redshift shift between one and two, and then it just keep dropping. But the gas content. Uh, doesn't seem to change as much, particularly the atomic gas. And unfortunately, uh, there's an imbalance between the optical galaxies, which you see all the stars, and the gaseous galaxy. That's because the surveys like Sloan are very successful. They produce, with redshift, a set of uh, uh, data of galaxies in terms of tens of millions. But in terms of gaseous galaxy, which measuring H1, 
we measure them like 10,000. The largest survey published so far has 15,000. So there's an imbalance uh, of two orders of magnitude. So the current plan is for FAST to do a joint sky survey with 1,000 telescopes, such as uh, Australian SKA Pathfinder. So uh, together, we are shooting for close to 1 million H1 galaxies. Because you are measuring a gas, you also get the redshift uh, by definition. So the goal is to increase our knowledge of the gaseous universe by uh, at least one order of magnitude. So in terms of compact stars, uh, pulsar was discovered in 1967. So that's one of the, the, the first uh, uh, chart uh, recorded data of pulsar by uh, uh, Madam uh, Bell. And we have a, a, a close uh, uh, collaboration with Jocelyn herself. So that's in 2012, 2015 at IU meeting. And just uh, last month, uh, she also visited NAOC and also our site. That's our uh, control room. So on the back screen, that's his pulsar. That's the Bell's pulsar uh, C 1919. And it's real fast data. So it has a signal to noise ratio of like 5,000. It it's almost look fake because you cannot see, see any noise on that. And Arecibo, which used to be the largest single dish telescope, is a fantastic pulsar machine. It's that covered the first millisecond pulsar. It also has this famous work that it discovered the first double neutron star. And by measuring the orbital decay, you can test general uh, relativity. So that's from Joe Taylor's 1993 uh, uh, Nobel uh, speech. He said, we find that Einstein theory passes this uh, extraordinary stringent test with fractional accuracy better than 0.4%. The necessary follows that gravitational radiation exists and has a quadrupolar nature. So I have been doing like ISM and uh, some galaxies. I never got too close to that accuracy. Maybe uh, George probably do things more, uh, much more uh, accurate than that. But as a uh, general astronomer, uh, it's, uh, we, we appreciate very much the opportunity to do actually a physics experiment in the astrophysical contest. So that's Joe Taylor at our uh, grand opening of the telescope uh, last uh, September. So this is, so in terms of gravitational wave and pulsar timing, uh, there are two obvious areas. The both fast has some advantage. One is to look for more closed binaries to do gravitational test. Uh, and another one is to try to use so-called pulsar timing array to direct detect the gravitational wave come from supermassive black hole binaries. So this is just uh, a, a short movie show the supermassive black hole binary, disturb the space time, and then it the wave traveling uh, from beyond the galaxy into the Milky Way, it will disturb the arrival time of the EM wave coming from uh, pulsars. And this will be a relatively weak signal, but if you can correlate the signal, you should be able to see the quadrupolar uh, signature on the sky. And this has been uh, also going on sort of simultaneously simultaneously as LIGO, uh, and it's very close to detection, also I was told. Um, so in terms of gravitational wave, last September, uh, we also signed with the LIGO and the Virgo consortium this MOU, so we will get the trigger event. And in the future, when we find bursts such like fast radio bursts and other potential gravitational wave event, we will also send information to them. Uh, so they can go back and process that data accordingly. So all pulsar signs start with pulsar search. So you want to find this clock first. So this is all the major uh, existing survey. Uh, we cover slightly larger area, but much deeper. And this is a prediction uh, based on uh, the uh, pulsar uh, population synthesis. So on this two portion, of the galactic plane, which is outside of, just outside of our civil sky coverage, which will have hundreds of new uh, pulsars just in this a few square degrees. And in effect, that's where we have been looking since August. This is the millisecond pulsar distribution. So looking beyond the galaxy, uh, it 
even just right after, just, just three years after the first pulsar detection, people already start to uh, hypothesize about pulsars in other galaxies. So that's Zhang Bako, Martin Rees, and F. Selpiger. And it turns out it's basically it's a sensitivity limited uh, effort because pulsar itself is a relatively weak radio source, although it's repeating. So you, uh, you try to add up all the pulse. But without knowing the period, as a prior, it's hard to dig those uh, signal out of the, the weeds or, or, or the noise. So the furthest uh, pulsar we know is in large Magellanic cloud, and, but the nearest spiral galaxy, the sort of sister of the Milky Way is M31 or Andromeda. That's two million light years away. If we can find a, a population of pulsar there, we can use the dispersion measure signal to try to measure the intergalactic medium, basically the electron content, and that also give you another probe of the dark matter halo uh, structure. And the current estimate is that FAST is sensitive enough to detect between 50 and 80 pulsars in M31, but that requires really long, like six hours of tracking, which we, we cannot do at the moment. So right at the moment we do drift, which is only about, say, 15, 20 seconds. So that's a really short integration time. But in that drift, we'll be sensitive enough to giant pulses, for example, from crab-like uh, pulsars. So that's an that's a estimate that uh, did by Crawford, Quarters, and myself. So we are actually trying to looking for giant pulses from uh, M31 as we speak. And we also estimate our pulsar uh, detection probability from globular clusters. So globular cluster is full of pulsars, and many of them were millisecond pulsar in binaries because they have a lot of dynamic interactions. In the future, it's also possible to use those millisecond pulsars as a probe to try to test whether there's an intermediate mass black hole in the center of the globular cluster, although none has, has been uh, really proved uh, uh, so far. So on that effort, uh, even before the fast get into operation in 2016, we reprocess this uh, old PARCS data. This is a 15-year monitoring data of 47 TAC. It's one of the largest globular cluster, but it's in the southern sky. There's already 23 pulsars uh, in that uh, data set. So we are not expecting to detect anything new. It's more like a training. But, uh, but one of my, uh, my students, uh, he's Zhi Chen Pan, he's so persistent. He managed to dig out of really this large noise and find two new ones. So this is their beat. And this chirp is the dispersion measure. And that's because the, the uh, uh, pulsar signal is EM wave traveling through interstellar space interact with the electrons. Basically, you have refraction. So the higher frequency signal arrive first, lower frequency signal arrive later. And so you get this chirp. And that's what we call dispersion measure. That's also how we differentiate the signal from the space than those from the Earth. Uh, and with pulsars, we're also looking into uh, uh, certain aspects of physics that we can do. So this is the positron uh, experiment result from AMS2. So they published this result in 2014 because they see this excess of positron beyond 10 GeV, which cannot be explained by cosmic ray uh, transfer model. And we are building this very simple model using a, a, a pulsar population synthesis. Uh, and basically, we only take pulsars within one KPC, because beyond uh, KPC, the neutron star generates positron. Uh, we just assume it cannot reach the Earth. But even within one KPC, the, the uncertainty about the pulsar uh, population is very large. So we can give it enough range that it's very, actually very easy to accommodate this access of positron using a small number of population of neutron stars. And uh, uh, also, if, even if we have see all the radio pulsars, uh, we only see about 10% of neutron stars because of the relativistic beaming effect. So we're large, there's always, there will always be a large population of neutron star that we will not see. Uh, so anyway, that's just, just one uh, uh, aspect of, of physics and astrophysics we can uh, probe. So now, uh, 
uh, people get uh, excited about like positron and cosmic rays because it one possible probe of dark matter, but it could be uh, difficult due to the uh, neutron star background. And this is the pie chart of the makeup of the universe. You have dark energy, dark matter. That's that's more in the energy term. And in here, you have the baryon. But baryon, uh, only a small fraction is so-called luminous matter. That's stars and galaxies. And all the rest is in basically in gas and plus some supermassive black holes and neutrinos. And uh, in astronomy, uh, a large uh, uh, field is to study how you turn uh, this unluminous matter into stars. And that's called star formation. And star formation uh, happens in interstellar gas. And the key process of interstellar gas is to turn from atomic gas to molecular gas. That's where you uh, attention of the universe transfer from physics to chemistry. <laughs> Once you, you go into molecules, it's become uh, basically a, a chemical problem. So uh, in, in that, uh, this is just uh, uh, one of uh, uh, my uh, project, but also highly relevant to FAST, is that in 2003, we utilized our SIBO, which has this new receiver, so we can do really uh, high, highly sensitive and high uh, spectroscopy resolution data. We can observe the molecular emission and H1 absorption at the same time. So we found this new population of H1 gas, so-called H1 narrow self-absorption, that seem to be mixed with molecular gas. With that, we can probe the formation time scale of molecular gas in different conditions. And that uh, measurement now has been used in combination with UE absorption in the galaxy formation simulations. And so we, we will uh, continue on this uh, line of research uh, with FAST because we have larger sky coverage, a better sensitivity, and we can do uh, we can do better measurement of so-called Hinsa signature of the galactic ISM. And in, in addition to uh, sort of a self-absorption, you can you also use the background light. And the most obvious target is so-called quasar. This active galactic nucleon is a very strong radio source. So those when those photon traveling through the, the Milky Way, it also get absorbed by foreground gas. And foreground gas, particularly those cold gas, uh, will leave a absorption signature. So there's this uh, uh, famous uh, paper by Hylist and Troland with over 400 citations that they give so far with 79 sources measured at the RCBO, the most comprehensive statistics of the galactic cold ISM through this quasar absorption technique. And with FAST and, and a small international consortium, we plan to increase that by another order of magnitude. Instead of uh, 80 sources, we go to 800 sources. And uh, we hope to done that uh, in the next five years uh, if, uh, if the operation is up to schedule. So this is a paper that uh, uh, we just, just submitted. Uh, we measure the OH uh, excitation temperature with our SIBO data. And we also speculate we can extend so all those uh, yellow sources from our SIBO and all those blue and red sources are from FAST. So basically we have, uh, because of our sensitivity and sky coverage, we can extend uh, such line of research. So all this uh, in terms of galaxies, uh, the pulsars, and the galactic ISM, that's come out of our five year of science preparation. Now we are planning for the next five years and we, come up with this plan, so-called the Commensal Radio Astronomy Fast Survey, or CRAFTS. Uh, as, long, as far as the uh, astronomical acronym goes, this is now the worst one, uh, given my experience at NASA. So the basic idea is this. Uh, the main survey instrument, in terms of speed and sensitivity, is this so-called 19-beam focal plane array. So we will, instead of one receiver, we have 19 receiver. And between each receiver, there's about one beam uh, space. So in order to, and, and this is how it looked uh, back in uh, CSIRO uh, Australia. So in, term or in, in terms of covering the space, you, you have to rotate them at a certain angle. 
And the scanning pattern depends on the rotating angle. And at a certain angle, you get this wonderful solution that you basically get 19 independent beams, but they overlap with each other. And we call it the super Naquist sampling. So if the beam size is three arc minute, the beam spacing is slightly less than a half of that. It's about 1.3, 1.4 arc minute. And use that if we form the dish as a 300 meter parabola, but don't move it, and just let the Earth rotate, we can do this drift scan. And there's a couple of advantages of doing the drift scan. One is the simplest possible mode that still has 100% of the sensitivity, because we don't have to move anything anymore. Once we measure it and form it, we just hold uh, the dish in shape. And that will prevent other complication, uh, including moving the dome and also self-generated radio frequency interference <laughs> Uh, from this complex uh, uh, mechanic system. And if we do that, uh, we need 220, 220 uh, full 24-hour scans. Basically, you, you do a large circle and do another one and do, do an, uh, another one. And in terms of real time, this will take at the minimum three years. Uh, and, uh, and everybody wants to do that because you survey the whole northern sky for galaxies for galactic ISM, for pulsars. And, but if everyone wants to do that, it will take a minimum 10 years. And by that time, this, like, the instrument and, and the, the science plan will be outdated. So the, the um, key word here is commensal. Can we do this drift once, but do the, all the science target at the same time? And it turns out it has never been realized before. This is such a obvious uh, uh, requirement for efficiency, and the reason is this. So this is the real data from Arecibo. It has a lot of <coughs> information. Each color uh, represents, uh, actually, in this case, uh, different uh, uh, density weighted velocity. Um, but you go this stripes that are the scan pattern, and that's because the gain of the telescope is changing. So even from the same source, you get a different uh, signal. And your eyes are very sensitive to pick that out. And that's after correction. In order to do this uh, correction, what we do is to inject electronic noise. And use that electronic noise with a known noise power, you can calibrate your gain. And the pulsar astronomers hate that because you inject noise like every second. And you free transform that, you get a strong power in the power spectrum, and they also got the harmonics, which is the second power, the, the, the fourth power, that mess up the whole pulsar search uh, routine. So that's a, a demonstration. That's a real experiment we did at Parks, 64 meter. So that's the, the, that's the, uh, the noise power without the cal. That's the cal signal. So once you inject that, you not, not only get the cal at the injected a frequency, which in this case is two hertz, but you also get all the higher uh, frequency signal. So that is the key reason why this has never been realized before. So if you look at the history of Arcebo, of Parks, of GBT, everybody will want to do galaxies, do galaxy ISM, do pulsars, but nobody do it at the same time. And we think uh, because this is our uh, sort of critical requirement, we think we are getting close to a solution. And with all the Euro uh, suspects, like Dick Manchester, George Hobbs, Bill Coase, Alistair, Alex Dunning at CSRO, and it's led uh, by our fast fellow, uh, Marco, uh, which we will still inject a cow, but we inject a really high frequency. So uh, we actually inject the sampling frequency, which is a one signal every 100 microsecond. By doing that, uh, you, because no pulsar rotates faster than one millisecond, well, none found yet, so you move all the power in Fourier transform into very high frequency domain. Uh, this also, this sounds uh, quite uh, straightforward, but uh, there's, uh, there's uh, quite challenging to uh, properly implement it, but I think in about three to four months, we should have a, a demonstrate, demonstrator system. So if we can do that, here is the, our wonderful plan. This is Andromeda. 
This is of a 19 beam feed form array. This is a scanning pattern. We only need about uh, seven scans to cover the whole galaxy. And if we do that for the 220 scan that I was talking about in about three years, in this one survey, we are going to get the best northern sky Milky Way map with 10 billion voxels, 300,000 galaxies, 1,000 pulsars, and about 50 fast radio bursts. So that will, all this number, uh, before fast from China is zero. And in five years, we want to, if we can get even anywhere close to those numbers, we'll be world leading in every one of those categories. And that's all good and planning. Um, but this is our observatory, and this is our security guard. Yeah, they are quite friendly. Um, this is the observatory building, building from the night. And down here, is, in the shielded area, is the uh, control room. So it's, when the observation really happens, it actually will be much busier than that. There's full of engineers roaming around. There's always something, some alarm goes off. And uh, it's quite, uh, quite exciting, actually. And, and we, we are still trying to figure out where exactly we pointed because it's a, it's very, a different system. And this is Carl Halas from Berkeley and our staff, and there's always, seem to be always some reporter from some station that is roaming around uh, that I, I try to stay away from them. Um, and this is George Hobbs from Australia, and that's back in the, uh, before October 10th, we actually tried to confirm our pulsar candidate uh, with the 64 meter Parkes telescope. We uh, didn't uh, succeed at the first, but on that exact day, we confirmed three. So it's, it, there's, there's some uh, fluctuation in, in luck and uh, in the uh, condition of the uh, telescope. So by now, this is the first announced uh, and confirmed uh, pulsar uh, from FAST. So we're basically doing the drift scan of the galactic plane from August. And we only do this during the night. But during the day, the engineers are still very hard uh, working, trying to commission the telescope. They have the control of the telescope. And during the night, uh, after dinner and drinking, people go to sleep. So we, we can sit at the computer <laughs> and actually look at the data. And this is a real single pulse from the pulsar. And this is so-called J1815-01, and with a 1.8 second period and roughly uh, 1.6, uh, no, 16,000 light years away, uh, judged by the dispersion measure. And that's a real signal. Well, it's, so, so we basically transfer the magnitude of the signal into a beep. And each signal is 1.8 uh, second. So this is the second pulsar. It's 0.59 second. So this is more like a small children's heartbeat or after you have run some treadmills. But this is real data. And if you can hear the EM waves, that's what you will hear. And this, our sky is full of this uh, signals at, at different strengths. It's actually uh, 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 pretty fun to, to do this uh, signal transformation. So now we put all the fast discovered pulsars online. And right now, it's, uh, it's, it's this all the data, but right now it's about 10. And we are uh, adding them up uh, as they come in. Um, so this will be this so-called craft survey will be a unprecedented commensal survey mode. And we are still working on bringing it uh, into reality. But I think we, we had uh, a reasonably good start. So I only have a few slides to go on a few um, forward-looking things. So at January of the cover, on the cover of Nature magazine, Xiaomi Chatterjee uh, lead this paper, this localization of the only repeating fast radio burst. So fast radio burst is this brightest EM burst below 3 gigahertz. And right now, the number of events uh, detected is about 20 or 24. And number of 
a theoretical paper published on it is much larger than that. So when you are in the field that the number of models is larger than the actual number of events, that means you, you need more data <laughs> to constraining it. So, so this particular event uh, is located in the dwarf galaxy at redshift point, point 2. And uh, it has stopped the biggest discovery in astronomy after LIGO by American Astronomical Society. Uh, this is the uh, discoverer of the first radio burst, the so-called Lorimer burst, uh, Duncan uh, Lorimer, who also spent some years in uh, uh, Cornell, so we, we uh, overlap a bit. Uh, he's visiting our site, and he's pretty happy on the, on the high-speed train. So this is clearly a new area, which is n not in our science plan, and it has various interesting challenges to instrumentation. And so we are trying to get a functioning uh, system uh, by the end of this year and try to uh, uh, improve upon on it. And the, the key thing, or at least my key drive on it, is that because of a sensitivity, I'll see whether we can use the FRB as a background light to catch the foreground ISM absorption. And this may also help localize it in terms of the redshift space, because in the absorption, we get the velocity or the redshift of that 21 centimeter line. Uh, that can only be accomplished by uh, uh, can, uh, it, many, many sort of channelized data at a very high speed, but also a very large telescope because you need photons in each of those channels to, to actually get a signal. So this is up until about a month ago. There's probably more updated 24 FRBs. About half of them are visible too fast. And there's only this one repeater this is a calculation I did last year. So we have a detection rate of about five to 10 every thousand hours. It's not very high because we, uh, we're large telescopes, so we have a small field of view. Uh, the last time I chat to uh, Ryan Shannon, he has like five times bigger uh, estimates. So this very much depends on the assumption about the log N log S distribution. If it's steeper, then we have more event at lower luminosity. Uh, and since we only get about 20 event, uh, there's, uh, this is just a rough uh, estimate. Now, fast radio bursts, which is written here, um, is just one of the wonderful uh, unexpected discoveries from radio astronomy uh, in the past half a century. So at the end of last year, Ken Kellerman, and also other scientists have tried this before, as a little summary of the radio astronomy discoveries, and, uh, and these are the ones from Arcebo. And I, I, I always found it um, interesting that people have ranked productivity of observatories, and of all the radio observatory. And rank at the top is always VLA. And near second is Parks because of their pulsar discoveries. And Arcebo is always the biggest uh, by far, but they rank sort of mediocrely in the middle because Arcebo is actually very complex to use, and there are many, many limits. It's not a very general observatory. But uh, Arcebo, on other harder-to-measure metric, is always leading. Because Arcebo always make breakthrough discoveries, like the spinning of the Mercury <laughs> uh, exoplanet and large organic molecules in distant galaxies, uh, millisecond pulsar, double ne neutron stars. So that's what a, if you, if you improve a critical parameter by one order of magnitude or more, you're going to open up new discoveries uh, space. Uh, that may not guarantee you a lot of papers. Uh, so I think that will be the mode that FAST will be operating on. It's a much more complex system even than even Arcebo. Hopefully we are going to open up new discovery space. But the main challenge at the moment is data. So this is just a, a rough estimate. We have 8-bit sampling, 100 microsecond uh, sampling rate, so that's 10,000 numbers every second, two polarizations, 4K channels in frequency, 19 beam. So you just product, produce, time them together, you get 1.6 gigabytes per second. Now, that's faster than any normal hard drive. You cannot even write a, a, a normal hard drive that fast. And it add up to about 10 to 20 petabytes per year. I only assume that we observe 50% of the time. And all the 
rest of the time, and that's roughly double the data rate of LSST. So we really need both human and the computer. And this is a quote from John Bolton from 1964. He says, if you make your observation by writing a set of instructions for telescope operator to carry out, and then write a set of instructions for a computer to extract some data from the result, then it's rather unlikely that you are going to find anything other than what you're looking for. But that's where we are at now. It's sort of uh, out of necessity. We'll still try to look at the data, but even all the graduate students <laughs> can only look a small portion. So we have to balance sort of artificial intelligence and real intelligence and don't totally filter out all the unexpected discoveries. Uh, and to help in that uh, effort, and so the Chinese Academy of Sciences in particular are very uh, keen on bringing international talent. So there's, there's different, there's visiting uh, fellowship, people like Duncan and Willy Peng and other people. There's also junior faculty program uh, with a starting up package between half a million dollar to a million dollar. There's also uh, long-term visiting between one and two months fellowship that uh, support, has supported like Carl Halas and George Hobbs. So everybody uh, who is interested, there's also postdoctoral fellowship. And we'll, of course, we also welcome exchanging student to actually go to the site and, and uh, get your hands dirty uh, on the telescope, which is fun. So um, I, I will end my talk. Um, on some of the uh, worries uh, that at the moment. One is that uh, the RFI environment, uh, because of the fast development of economy and population nearby, is, is getting worse by the day. Uh, and that's uh, very troubling. And also, uh, the FRB and gravitational wave are sort of the trendy thing of the day. But we still take at least a month to sort of get in the game, but we probably take slightly longer to, to, to be any good at it. So we, there, there's a pressure there. And also how we are going to meet this big data challenge to preserve the unknown unknowns uh, in the data. And in the end, uh, it will be hopefully unprecedented survey. Uh, we are facing unprecedented hardships. And hopefully, we can realize some of its unprecedented potential. So Dr. Nan uh, has been driven this project since early 1990s, along with his colleagues in NLC. Unfortunately, he passed away this September, just almost on the day that we confirmed the first pulsar, which is uh, both good and bad. Uh, so this is in 2012. This is my uh, first meeting as an NLC staff, and, and he's always uh, energetic and, and uh, give a pointed uh, comments, and we are carrying along uh, this work. So I will ending this quote from myself in 2013. Uh, so I've been, in, I've been the deputy chief engineer for the last few years, and I, I, I have two hats, but I'm mostly still a scientist since I'm not qualified for uh, as a good engineer, um, just a, a temporary role. But the more I'm in the uh, construction and commissioning aspect, uh, you, you, you see the limit more. It, the best time is when you have idea and you make a proposal but you don't get any money. That's the best time because without money, you can solve whatever question you have in mind. It's an imaginary a telescope with uh, the limit is your imagination. And then you, you, you got some money and it's always not enough. And then you have to cut the parameter space into a redshift 0.2, you go to 0.1, and the data rate is, is constraining. And now we just finished building. Now we realize we have zero dollar for big data, and the data is more, and we don't budget in for fast radio bursts, but that seems, seems to be the, the hottest thing at the moment. Um, so I said the building telescopes game of shrinking dreams. But if we start it big enough, I hope I can leave you the impression that by the end of this October, we still have a dream. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question that uh, uh, in about some of the functionalities of FAST, you said that uh, we can uh, measure the 21 centimeter absorption light, but uh, why, why is that absorption light is important? 
compared to all the absorption light from all the signal outside right. space. Right, there's, uh, um, yeah, well, yes, um, basically if you have a bright enough source on the background, you can measure in absorption any gas that is colder than the background source. But you're also limited by the factor that how much foreground cold gas you have. And the hydrogen, the atomic hydrogen is everywhere. And it's one key part, a majority part of the interstellar medium. So you will have a lot of atomic hydrogen. And we also try to measure hydroxyl, which is OH. So you have oxygen and hydrogen. That already gets much harder because the oxygen is just so much less than hydrogen. And so the H1 absorption is the easiest or the most obvious thing to do. Now, if you have interesting enough background source, like the fast radio burst, then if you, you can measure foreground absorption, then you put that source at least further away, further beyond your absorbing gas. So that gives you a, a interesting and strong limit of where it is. And if you can even measure it uh, around that source, then that gives you even more information. But that's uh, sort of exploratory at the moment. Uh, but by measuring that kind, for example, you can determine the position of the uh, hydrogen gas in the universe. So what kind of information you can get from those results? Uh, right. So, so that's two large categories. One is we get information of the absorbing gas itself. So that's what usually we say the column density and the excitation temperature. That's basically the quantity of foreground absorbing gas and, and its temperature. So that's two uh, fundamental quantities. And the second category information is that you may also get some information on the background absorber uh, in terms of its location and its surrounding environment. And uh, depends on your science goal that both of them can be important. I heard that the uh, radiation source from a pulsar could be due to synchrotron radiation or just a charged particle hitting the surface of the neutron star to give you kind of a black body radiation. So in your observed spectrum, can you actually tell from the characteristics which mechanism is the oh, right um, one? That's, that's very hard. So the uh, pulsar... Because of the limited uh, frequency range. Not only that, it's more, the, the pulsar is an object that is like 10 to, 1 to 10 kilometers. So when you put it at astronomical distances, it's always a point. You, even the large interferometers cannot resolve it. And what you got is an aggregate of photons, and it, it can come from uh, different distances from the surface of neutron star. Also, there's relativistic beaming. Also, it depends on the configuration of the magnetic field and all those coupled t uh, together. So the pulsar emission mechanism uh, has been looked at uh, closely for the past 40 years, but we are sort of still arguing over similar uh, argument like, like before. So the so last month, we had this... Uh, 50-year uh, anniversary meeting in Manchester and Jocelyn Bell and Joe Taylor and other people were also there. People talk about things. Thing. And there's this one talk on emission mechanism uh, from Princeton that they build a model with superconducting superfluids. Then you have vertex and you also tie the vertex like a, a tornado. Then you have power production. Then you have acceleration. Then you have to put in general relativity because it's close to the surface. And then you put everything t uh, together, what you got is a emission profile, uh, which is, is a very sophisticated work. But on the other hand, it's hard to uh, discern between sort of the actual macrophysics uh, uh, aspect. So it's still uh, the actual e uh, e emission mechanism is still very tough. I think the, the, the current sort of more popular forefront of neutron star. One is because of there's a couple of sources that has two solar mass uh, measured from binaries. And, uh, and that provides, that poses a challenge to the normal uh, neutron star equation of state 
uh, picture. So, so people are, uh, there's many, many physics to work on. The other is just using pulsar as a tool because it's a clock. You, you get a, a periodic signal to use that to, to measure all sorts of things to do gravity tests. And people also use that to measure the mass of Jupiter. <laughs> and, uh, and that also get to be highly precise now, uh, uh, nowadays. Okay, so uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Lee again.